Item 2 on the agenda tonight is the adoption of the May 18th meeting minutes. Uh, if you have uh, changes or corrections, uh, I ask that you be prepared to uh, read those into the record so that we can make the appropriate change. Are there any changes to the minutes? I move that the minutes be I second it. Okay. All those in favor of said motion signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Uh, we got our operational uh, snapshot today again. And uh, I think this is progressing pretty well. Um, this is an opportunity for us to ask some questions about what we see going on and happening. Does the committee have any questions? Concerns that they would like to address the staff on these numbers. Um, I have a question then um, that uh, the, the new licenses, it still seems really low compared to last year, uh, 794 uh, compared to 2,319 last year. Do we have any information on why we're running so low on new licensing? Yes, Mr. Chair. That is, the, there is a slight decline, but it's more the way that it's reported. Um, we get the licensing from the clinics come in sometimes two, maybe oh. even three months after the month that the, the license is for. So for the current month, for the month of May, we don't have a lot of licenses to even go through and enter in to, to enter into the system. So the reporting is a little skewed, but I did take a look at it. And, and you're right, if you look at the data summary here, there's a 38.2% drop from the, pre from the previous year. So I had uh, I had Josh pull the 45, first 45 days of 2016 and the first 45 days of 2017. And there was a drop, it was a 12% drop. It's not nearly as bad as it's reflected here. And again, that's because of the previous year, they had the time to catch all those licenses that took another 40 days to come in for that month. And they're counted, but we haven't gotten that information yet. So going back three months and looking at it, the, the percentage difference is, is just a little over 10%. Okay. Well, you know, I have an agenda item coming up where we can maybe talk a little bit more about it, but do we have any requirements for our offsite clinics to, you know, like timeliness in terms of when they have to submit their license materials back to us? Is that in the contracts at all? None that I'm aware of. I just, just had a chance to sit on this week and talk to Josh about this. And, and he's relatively new to the position as am I. But none that I'm aware of. Um, but that we did make a note to to explore that and find out if there is a contractual or agreement or a condition. Yes, ma'am. Um, I worked at the Humane Society for a very long time, and I work at Santa Cruz for Dr. Carter right now. And the problem isn't that it, at least it wasn't the Humane Society who does the majority of the licensing. It's not they get in in a monthly timely fashion. It's I've had to tell people on the phone, please give PAC two to three months to get your license. So I think that we need to fix it on our end here at PAC as opposed to dealing with the doctors. I, yes, ma'am, I understand that. And like I said, we're going to look into that and find out there's a billing cycle that they get lost in. There's, there's a few offices that touch it before PAC actually sees it. Josh had suggested an idea maybe they could just submit at the end of the month a spreadsheet to PAC that we can update that information and go back and, and later on and check and see if there were any discrepancies against that. It's creating uh, extra work, but I think it would be for what we could clean up our records for that, you know, bring more time on our records and, and get the licenses out to people quicker. I think that that might be a better solution, but uh, he's also looking at some possibilities of maybe some online registrations or some where that can be handled much quicker than the, the system we're going through now. But one of the ideas, again, is to maybe remove the, the additional people that have to touch the, the, uh, the information before we see it, maybe get it, split it to us and to them at the same time so that Pat can get it in or distribute it. So what I'd like to do is we can have a little bit more uh, deep dive on this when we have it on the item C on the business. Okay. Very good. Uh, would you like to do it right now or would you like to do it C? Okay. Um, are there any other Questions on the, on the numbers? Uh, it looks like our number of confiscations of dogs has gone, was up at least compared to last year, a significant, significant amount. I don't know if we have any information on why we just, we just got some bad cases. 
we've had uh, we've had a couple of recent calls that were pretty large numbers of animals. Um, I can I can look into it a little bit more if you'd like, Mr. Chair. But uh, but right off the top of my head, I couldn't give you the exact. I know that we've had several large cases with, with multiple multiple animals as far as courting cases go. Uh, we we have a new investigations unit in, inside the enforcement okay. that has been very proactive. Uh, and it's proactive to the point where they're finding more of these type of uh, large case uh, cruelty and important cases. So that, that we have had a pretty big intake, especially in the cat population recently. We've had probably 200 cats brought in in the last month. So there's been quite a, quite an uptick in that. I have one more one more now on others. Uh, adoptions offsite for several months now in the snapshot have been lower than they were the previous year. We've been putting a lot of effort, you know, I know it's a lot of staff time to organize our off-sites on the weekends and those kinds of things, especially like at Petsmark. So I'm just curious when we have an opportunity, I think we need to drill down that a little bit and figure out or, or make some conjecture about why we don't think we're you know, successful with adoptions off-site. Because it's important with the amount of effort, and I want to get those numbers back up. You know, the, the off-site adoption effort is always important in and the reoccurring on a lot of um, volunteer resources and a lot of um, pack resources in order to, to get them done. Um, and right now, we just have a lot of stuff going on that are taking up a lot of bandwidth. Um, and that's part of the reason why you see um, the adoption numbers not being uh, what they have been in the past. Um, but one of the things that, that I'm hoping that at some point we do for the advisory committee is to sort of present a kind of a comprehensive um, kind of adoption update. Because I think looking at one month's numbers, um, even though they're, they're help, it's helpful, um, it, it really kind of is, is only part of the picture. Um, and, and understanding how the sort of this activity fluctuates um, throughout the year, I think is, is is better and, and thinking about this is a, this is a place where, where we could really use some advice I think on the part of um, the advisory committee right so um, we have a presence here with some of the retailers in town uh, at Smarts and stuff um, but but there have been other proposals to include other venues for that kind of off-site adoption and those proposals may or may not be something that, at least from the volunteer standpoint or the advisory committee standpoint, are seen as a positive thing. And we would want to vet those with you guys before we before we invested a lot of uh, resources and effort in that. Would you like me to put it on a future agenda as something that you would give, us, give us more details on what those proposals might be? Um, I think at, at, at some point in the future that would be terrific. I'd like to wait for our, for our new director to be in place um, to help have that individual help us sort of shape the calendar uh, for the rest of the year. So I don't want to commit to a specific time um, because he or she may have a different opinion. Well, um, but I think it's but, it, but I think it, it, it is a super important issue that, that that you guys need to sort of be involved in, and uh, you're asking the right question. I, I hear what you said, and I appreciate it. From my perspective, as a volunteer, I would think one of the other uh, numbers of considerations might be what resources we have to expand to other vendors and other sites. Because you know, we only have so many of the old trucks that we let people use to deliver animals. You know, those kinds of things. We have so many people that load their money because they, in the past they were contending with cleaning and all that kind of thing on the weekend. So. Those are some of the logistical issues that we should probably discuss to the people who are here. Sure. Yeah. I apologize, Doctor. It might be interesting, just it could be a simple calendar for the next six months on where we go. We go to PetSmart in September, two weekends. I mean, it would just oh, be yeah. interesting. Okay. Just kind of just, it doesn't have to be perfect. Well, it, it doesn't have to say three to five, but just here's our plan right now, or here's where we were the last six months. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Ms. Oliver, I think it would be relatively easy for us to say this is what we've done in the last six months, and this is what our plan is for the next six months, um, and at least so that you guys can sort of have a sense for that. Yeah. We, we, this off-site adoption 
think Pat will sort of attest to that. These offsite adoption pieces are really important, um, but they also require a lot of um, volunteer effort and a lot of uh, staffing um, preparation. And, um, and so, even though it seems like a, a really easy peasy kind of thing to do, it, it ends up being a bit complicated. So, but we want to give you an eye toward that, and that's relatively easy for us to provide. Mr. Chair, um, as I'm looking at the data summary, I can't recall when we started asking for this if the board or if our, our board or our committee voted to have this monthly. I thought we were going to get this like quarterly so that we could get the real the real look at it. I mean, I think I agree with you. This this doesn't really tell me anything. And it just gives you a lot of questions and I can't I'm not even gonna spend my time looking at this because I know that it's not giving me the truth. So I don't know, I would like to get it quarterly or else only look at it quarterly. <laughs> well I thought we'd get all agreed on this I, I don't know. Get these things meeting, but then it would be like a biannual or or a summary like every six months. Where you actually might grab some of this and try to make some some draw some information out of it. Mr. Chairman, Ms. Hubbard, we were committed to providing this to you. Um, it is it is the, the chairs and the committee's um, uh, purview to decide whether you're going to ask us questions about this. My preference would be that, and we had made a, uh, a comment about trying to do this on a, a twice annual or maybe quarterly basis, I think would be reasonable, um, because, because there is a lot of noise in these numbers. Um, and the other thing that we uh, also want to sort of the other thing that gives them a little bit of perspective is, is having the year-to-date kinds of figures. Because this is just, this is literally meant to be a snapshot um, and not meant to be a, a comprehensive review of, of all our intakes and, and um, outcomes and enforcement actions. So we're happy to, we're happy to not have this be a standing agenda item and just provide it so that you put it in your notebook um, and um, we can always uh, you know, revisit it on a quarterly basis. Well, I, you know, my only comment is that when I make my comments about these, I do the previous ones and have a feel for if that number's going up or down, that's where I'm coming from. But we are about six months into, since we started this. Mm -hmm. It's June now, and uh, it took us a few months to get this worked out. We finally kind of consolidated it by January, so we're at about that biannual point now, which we're going to start. Um, you know, pulling together some numbers for us to talk about. So maybe that's something for the new director to do. But uh, I, I would urge staff to start thinking about that. Absolutely. We'll start planning for something like that. I, I just want to state that, I mean, we do find the, the monthly is still going to be valuable, I think, and whether we discuss it every month, I would agree with Dr. Garcia at that point. I don't know if that's necessary all the time, but I love getting monthly data and build that record is very helpful. It also, we also have to acknowledge that we're in kind of a really super weird flux time with all the things that have gone on, with the craziness with construction. So I, I'm a, the city I don't think is holding a ton of stock in this year's cycle of numbers as we go through this, recognizing that once we're in a new structure, once we have things going, things may start to look very different um, at that point too. So I think the data is great. I think it's great to do a year-over-year -year comparison. Um, I do think, Barry, you're absolutely right, Mr. Chair, that uh, you know, um, a deeper dive, maybe uh, a month or two from now, to really dive into what we've got after we kind of streamlined this and got it there would be great. But yeah, if, if everybody's comfortable not doing this every month, I think that's fine, because sometimes it is hard to track. We, we could see, for instance, looking at this data compared to last year on the adoption, on the outside adoption, there's so many different reasons that could be, and we could play major catch-up through the rest of the year. So it just depends on what's been happening. I would be open to the committee's direction, comments as to whether they would like to have this as a, a continued agenda item each month, whether we put it on quarterly or something like that, and we can use the agenda that way. I've had it as a standing item on number two, but if the committee sees fit, we can change that. So if there's any feedback on that, I appreciate it. Yeah. Mr. Chair, if you could, I just, I, you had asked a little bit earlier about the confiscations that I sent a message to my protection service manager, and 130 of those animals were from two hoarding cases in the last month, so. Okay. 
that's, that's you know, they're done very proactive field work. So. Yeah. And I think it's safe to say that the majority of those cats have been very home for fosters. Oh. One of those, and I apologize, was one of those cases of Miranda? Yes, it was. So, so you know, as we think about how we manage the facility on a go-forward basis, those are the kinds of uh, things that we're going to need to sort of keep our heads. Um, because, like you said, um, uh, Mr. Squire, this is a this year we are this is a flux year. We're going to be seeing some funky operational things. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, when I look at this, for me, it. it seems that the numbers have to make sense from being removable. And I also think of the workload that goes into this as well. So I think the monthlies are important, but trends I think are even more important. So we're looking at something maybe quarterly. So you can do monthly and then at the quarter timeline, um, do it a year to date. And also, I think the seasonality that you mentioned, I'm not quite familiar with what that seasonality looks like, but maybe is it the quarterly that would pick up the seasonality? Or is it the semi-annual that picks up the seasonality? That's what I think would be really conducive for the, for the community. Yeah, Do you have thoughts? I don't have any answer to that. Um, um, maybe those on the staff that have had many years of Kind of thinking about these numbers, tell us or Pat, you know, well, your experience trying. with the Humane Society, how animal uh, issues fluctuate. You know, I know we get overrun with animals in the summertime. Well, yeah. if we all know the cats for you all year round, right? Maybe <laughs> 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 they bring a little more off in the, in, the, in the spring. And uh, we are, are going to always get more cats. Dogs are pretty much, they go pretty much the same. You know, they don't really have a a spring or a summer or a fall, they just bring all the time. So a quarterly with a year. Uh, but yeah, but as far as as far as the, the reports go, you know, being on PAC Act for almost 20 years, the reports that we used to get had that history. And there's a new a new committee, we're building our own history. So I think that's what we're gonna have to do is we're gonna have to, you know, get a little bit ahead, wait a little bit, and then once we can see what's going on, it'll be a picture for us, not what we did in the past, but what we're doing now. And, 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 and Mr. Chair, uh, Ms. Pena, and Ms. Howard, uh, one of the things that I'll remind you of is that this is a, this is particular reporting tool is a new tool that we just developed specifically for this new advisory committee. In response to the kinds of questions that you were asking that you said you were interested in, and in response to the kinds of things that we thought or meaningful metrics too. So, so, and that's part of the reason why the old numbers may not be comparable to the new numbers, right? Because we, we came up with, with very strict definitions on a go forward basis. Um, and so we are just building that history. Pat is absolutely right. We're just building that history. And I think these numbers will become increasingly useful as we start to look at them uh, in a longer term. Mr. Chair, um, and so I think going back to your comments, Ron, I just even maybe in quarterly or the six months, a, a few paragraphs of narrative. Oh, we had the outbreak. Oh, this happened. Oh, we had an emergency. I mean, just a few things that outline the past quarter that would be on top. You know, not I know it. I know we receive them in our minutes, but it's not right here. So just even it doesn't have to be beautiful. Yeah. No, no, I, I get what you're saying. Which is the context. Yeah. So I'll, I'll put forward a motion that we um, go ahead and uh, ask for that kind of uh, recap to happen quarterly at this point while we still continue to receive the monthly the data would come to us monthly. We go to a quarterly and, and in this case um, maybe if we go to the back end of the quarter since we're coming up in September will be the end of the third quarter. Um, I think that'd be a good time at the September meeting to delve in uh, to that deeper dig. It'll also be post-summer. We'll figure out where all our stats are coming from construction, 4th of July, all of our joyous things that cause great surges at the facility. So, I move that. I'll second. A motion was made by Mr. Squire, seconded by Ms. Almquist. Any discussion on that motion? Uh, let me just clarify then, uh, the motion is that we would continue to get uh, data snapshots, mm -hmm. but we, we uh, 
I'm not clear on whether you want on the agenda. No, it doesn't need to be on the agenda, so we'll do a quarterly so agenda. We'll get the snapshot sent out to everyone, but that we will do a deep dive on a quarterly basis. The first to be in September 1st. Um, and if, yeah. if that's clear to everyone, all those in favor of said motion signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. So I need to take it. Yes, you do. Thank you, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Um, old business, tenth contingency plan. Uh, you know, the reason this is on there is uh, we mentioned at the last meeting that we were developing new policies that you, you know, were vetting through partner agencies and groups, and uh, the committee has had expressed an interest in knowing what those policies were when we developed. So I don't know if we're done yet, but we wanted to. Uh, know what those new policies are in terms of you know, how we handle intense situations. Yes, sir. Sure. I have not gotten uh, the final nod back from a couple of, uh, from our facilities management and facilities management. Um, but I, I talked to, uh, I was able to talk to facilities today, and they don't feel that their involvement in, in the actual SOP is enough. And if you're complaining, I'll send it out to everybody. Well, if you could staff the staff of the draft program. Um, you know, I think we're, we're still circulating this internally and externally. Um, we want to make sure that our internal partners are aware. Um, but, but for instance, right now, SUNT is a big part of uh, our planning here. Um, we are reaching out to the city of Tucson and the city of South Tucson right now, actively trying to do some some contingency planning in different areas. So, um, so yeah, I, I think that I have no problem sharing with the. the as a draft. Mr. Chairman, I'd be happy. I'll send it out this evening when I get back. And I think we've had a chance to share it with a couple of people. Uh, and I, as a, just a point of procedure, I did get with Sun, finally you come back from them, and they are they have estimated completely and they don't feel that they're involved in any way. So huh? they they signed off on it. So. Okay. If I might just suggest I would <coughs> recommend that you send the policy through Mary yes, and so it's kept on the record for this group and that she can distribute it to the community. And for the members of the public that are here, this was a, all about a discussion that we had at the last meeting about uh, several things. Planning for if we had a catastrophe with the tent because it's got long past its, uh, you know, its due date. Uh, planning for heat issues, you know, new electricity. Uh, planning how we might evacuate animals or move them. Uh, so it's a whole series of things that. Uh, they've been trying to develop some policy and planning, and it's, it's, it's fairly complicated because if we got into that situation, we are going to need to involve not only other county departments, but other community partners to help us solve the problem in a quick way. So that's why it's become a little bit bigger than we originally anticipated. Uh, Andrew. Mr. Chair, if I may, so I went and met with Kino and um, with the Deputy Director of Facilities, Kino? That's correct. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, and uh, I went in with uh, construction eyes on instead of analyze because it's amazing when you go into the tent and you're focused on the dogs, you don't look at the tent. Um, so so you don't think about it sometimes. So in this case, we went and looked at it. Um, uh, I learned a lot about what they've done. I was kind of impressed with how they've made that work, the way they've made it work for as long as they have. Um, the fact that, you know, in an extreme scenario, we, we actually, the, the way the foundation is set, we actually literally replace the tent. The problem is, is that you've got to order that tent We'd have to have it in inventory. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we'd be waiting two weeks for a tent. That's not going to happen. So I reached out to the uh, convention center after talking with the management. The convention center is looking at dates to see if there would be availability. We do have some conflicts, but we might be able to work around those. In the event of an extreme emergency where we lost the entire structure, um, the goal would be to, for a very temporary basis, get the animals housed in one of the X halls, uh, which has air conditioning, electric, water, all the stuff you would need to get it done, plus computer data, terminals, and from there, we then would work uh, through the procedures that Kino has kind of in, uh, in draft in place right now, which would be to call in all the volunteers to do a pickup from the facility to kind of temporarily foster those animals until such time as we could get some more permanent uh, arrangement made. So knock on wood, um, it, it will be something that we can make happen. Um, bigger knock on wood, it never is necessary. Um, that's the key piece. but. We are, we are really trying to think about it. One of the biggest challenges will be, as Kino pointed out, which is really valid, if in fact we have a weather event that takes out that tent, odds are that weather event will also make it very difficult to access the facility at all. 
um, via the roadways and because of all the construction slop. So it's going to be important for Pima County staff, probably the city of Tucson helping, to vacate the animals to a point where residents could come pick them up to foster. So we'll keep working on that and I'll keep Kino and, and Dr. Garcia informed where we go. I know uh, my assistant city <coughs> is helping me with that. Yes, sir. I have a question to you and this just popped into my head. Yeah. It's okay. You know, when we have a gym show every year, we have those huge. Are there any of those in town that stay up year round? No. Okay. On purpose, they do. Yeah, they're expensive and they wear out. Yeah. So, so you don't want to keep doing it. The other problem is buried with that is that those tents require uh, the same kind of issues that Kinos does. You got to have portable air conditioning. You have portable units, and those those run really well in February. Uh, it's very effective, <laughs> very efficient, and uh, they keep things going very nicely. They, yeah, they don't do so well at 110. Um, <laughs> the tents are kind of thin. So that, the, the, the great thing about a facility like the TCC in that kind of an emergency um, is that we can separate the X-Halls. For the space that you have uh, at that facility, you would just need one X-Hall. There's three separate X-Halls creating 400,000 square feet. Um, that contains our costs, that controls exposure. Um, it, it would be a situation that would be pretty secure. So, worst case scenario, that is our hope that we can make that happen. And we're, we're juggling some scheduled stuff to see if we can just leave that slot available and make it work. So, um, is it is it uh, okay and clear that when the uh, draft of the policy is distributed that it, it's then public, right, for uh, public consumption? I think as long as it's stamped draft. Yes, I mean, I think I, I, I'm I'm perfect. There is nothing proprietary. There is nothing. There is nothing top secret about it, um, and it just gives you an idea of the things that we are thinking about. Uh, the other statement that I would make, Mr. Chairman, and it is just because the members of the public here, I don't want people to be under the impression that I think this thing is going to collapse right now, right. because because that would be the wrong impression to get. Right. What I'm trying to do is I'm trying to get our team to think of this affirmatively with the, with the thought that if we plan for the worst circumstance, it hopefully will not happen. So I always plan for the worst and expect the best. Um, and um, and they, uh, you know I, I'm hopeful um, that um, that we will get through the summer, but I also need to be prepared uh, for uh, alternate contingencies. Any other uh, questions, comments by the community, Christy? Can we ask about uh, some of the current like temperature status? Okay, so um, I, I know I sent in some emails and some questions and got some answers, but. Um, we had some um, reports in the last two months about things that might happen or things that we're planning to do, um, and it sounds like some of those things have changed. Can you tell us about the things that have changed since last month's report? Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let Kino talk about that, but, but I'll preface it with, by letting you know that, that, that even on the, on the human side um, on intake, our, our AC went down yesterday. Um, and, so, and so this is impacting this is impacting the facility as a whole, um, and you're absolutely right, Christy, um, Ms. Oliver, that we are that we are having to sort of right adjust the the plan as we go along, depending on resources and depending on the availability of, um, of support. Yeah, Ms. Oliver, um, we we got discussed previously in email some of the ideas and suggestions and things that we're going to do, and some of those you had. As you say, have changed. What we have done to date, additionally, since last week, um, facilities is mounted four additional fans. They're pretty large industrial fans, and they're mounted up higher in the supports. Uh, they're overhead, and we're trying to get some of that air, that stagnant air, basically up there moving around. Um, they seem to be helping out. We're still playing with what direction they need to be facing, and whether tilted up or tilted down. It's about half science and half moving. You know, <laughs> But those fans are in place. We do have the additional power in the northwest corner, and I put a fan back over in that corner a couple of days ago. The uh, facilities have also come in and relocated or, or installed a, um, a generator access panel uh, to the wall right where the dumpsters are in the, in the parking lot. And they're going to be bringing in a generator and pre-staging it at the area so that if we do lose power in the tent, this will be only for the tent. They can uh, fire that generator up, make a connection, and the tent will be back up, completely back up, and everything will be running. Uh, that would probably take about 
30 minutes because it has to be somebody from facilities that comes out and makes that connection and starts a generator. But once that's in place, everything will be set. And we're looking at maybe 20, 30 minutes where we could be back up and running with power. So that uh, the, the connection's installed, everything's ready. They just got to bring the trailer over and, and drop them off on the generator on it. The uh, large HVAC system that sets up at the clinic now, the facilities have decided not to move forward with that. There, I guess there are several complexities with trying to get that, that idea to work. Uh, and they think that the time and effort would be better spent in, in other areas, so they decided not to move forward with that. And I talked with uh, Tony Sikaros at facilities, and he does have some additional air conditioning units on hand for us if we do lose some of the portable air conditioners, we do have replacements on hand for those. Um, we've talked about putting some of them into play now, um, and it's, it's the decision of would we rather have them on hand brand new ready to work if we lose a unit completely or would we rather bring a couple of them over now? So we're still kind of trying to decide how, how much we want to rob from that bank to try and put in the, in the tent now. We've been real fortunate this summer. I think every summer we learn a little bit more about the tent and, and we apply what we've learned. Uh, the temperatures are about 14, 15 degrees below the outside temperature. Uh, we've, we've hit 89, I think, is the highest we've had in the tent this year. Yeah, and it's a different kind of 89 than it was. It's a much, it doesn't feel 89. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's the, the, the air moving around in there, it seems to be a drier, it's not like you're in the rainforest in there anymore. Yeah, three weeks, we'll see. <laughs> and, and, and to that point, that is our concern is, I, I think we're, we can comfortably say, except for the days where we're going to be hitting, if, if we have those 112 degree days coming, uh, we're going to have to look at the animals that are in there, move some animals out and take some action that way. Once we get into monsoon, and the efficiency of that evaporative cooling system is crippled, then we're the, there will have to be a different action taken, and that's what we're still working with facilities management on right now, what the best plan for that is. But they're, they're, they are active, they have a crew out about once a week, just walk around and check the coolers and pads and, and go through everything. They're also at, not directly attributing to the cooling question, but they're replacing the perimeter wire on the bottom of the tent now, so the sides won't blow up like they have been for so long. Uh, they were out today installing that perimeter wire, then they got called away because the air conditioner quit somewhere in the county. But, it's, uh, it, it, it's one of the banes of our existence. I, you know, I realize that we have uh, the air conditioner down at Aqua right now, too. So that's in addition to everything going on at PAC, I've got a you know, two and a half hour drive away. I've got an air conditioner equipped on us, too. So. But that's in order to be replaced replace and put some uh, portable units out there for them. So there is, there is action going on. I'd say the only loss that we suffered, and I don't know if it was a real loss, was that portable HVAC unit for the BASEX system. Uh, again, because we obviously don't even know if it works. Uh, it's been started for so long. It, you know, it, it could be something that, that we might find out it needs so much money to get, but I don't know, I can't speak to any, any authority on that. So, uh, but they decided not to move forward with that because of the, the power requirements and, and how it has to be hooked up and, and the loss of efficiency for how far it has to be away from the, from the tent. So that's the, um, that's about the only plan that we've started to move forward on that, that is not going to see completion. We're still working on everything else. The, as uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, as part of the as part of the, the facility side of the house, um, you know, Kino and, and the team have done a really good job of working with facilities to try to optimize what we have. If I never see another ten, my mind, it will be too soon. Um, on the on the uh, operational side of the house, uh, there, there have been communications, and, and Dr. Wilcox said something about how important it is that, that the animal, that there not be any bedding in those kennels, that, 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 that the cool floor is, is one of the most important things that we can sort of have for our animals, that, that what kinds of things to look for. I, I didn't know if you wanted to make any comments. I, she and the clinical team are, are all, all over it in terms of trying to identify animals who are at risk or are adversely impacted. What was the term? Cold floor? The, the cool floor, oh, the cool oh, okay. floor is, is, is part of the way that we have, that one of the things that we have to keep our animals as safe and comfortable as they can. Yeah, for all of the, the agonizing that we put ourselves through, we haven't had any heat stroke or heat exhaustion cases in the tent in the three years that I've been trying to get through summer. But we, we did have two the exhaustion cases from dogs walking, just mm -hmm. walking, um, before 10 o'clock, two weeks ago. So, um, 
everyone's on high alert, and I think sometimes we forget how powerful um, temperature can be. But for a dog that's that's not moving and laying on a cool cement floor, you know, we're very vigilant. But um, I think we're, we're back on high alert. Mm -hmm. Christine, um, I have two more questions. Um, one is, do we have a procedure for opening and closing, um, like what things get turned on in the morning and what things get turned off? Um, I know we did get a response, I did get a response from um, Jose Chavez that he turns everything on in the morning when he gets in. I don't know what time that is, I don't know what happens on the days that he's not there. Or, you know, is there something that, because volunteers are the first ones in the tent every day. Um, is there something that can be shared with us so that we can assist or know what to look for if there's a problem, know what to report? Um, that's one question. Yes, certainly. Um, and the direct answer to your question is yes, we do, but it's very outdated. Uh, it, it was actually created from the days when we didn't have enough power and there was a limited amount of things that could be turned on in a certain order that they had to be turned on in. Um, it, but we, we are past that now, so. Uh, in answer to the, 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 the spirit of your question, I will, I will get with Jose and create something, uh, Jose Chavez, okay. but what I, the general rule of thumb is that at night we want to leave all the fans running 24 hours a day. We want them running overnight to try and get that massive hot air up there down it and cool off a little bit so we're, we have a head start of the next day. Uh, the AC units we try not to leave on at night just because we can double their life by well, around 50% of the time. So, but. Uh, we leave the, uh, the installed uh, event coolers running all night long. Uh, though we're looking right now, one of, the, one of the things that I just talked about facilities about is maybe turning that the evaporative cooling system to just fan only at night. So we're not pumping in moist air, but we're getting fresh air circulating through there. So that would probably be, but in, in answer to the spirit of question, yes, I'll, I'll sit down with him and we'll come up with a, a policy and post it. I believe we're probably that old one is that, that was all handwritten. And, we did, we, have, we did have something that we'll, we'll revise that for you. Um, my second question was, uh, you talked about the backup generator that hopefully will be coming any day now because <laughs> um, what percentage of power does that have compared to what the regular, you know, what the tent is at now? I mean, I'm imagining it can't provide the same amount of power. I'm told it's a pretty large unit. I mean, it's, covers, it's, it's going to take a whole parking spot it's on a trailer. And I'm told that it will power the complete tent as it sits. That will lose no services in the tent. Which is really critical because 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 that's probably our most vulnerable physical asset. Yeah. Um, and so it would mean the difference between having kind of a fully operational tent unit with all its inefficiencies and, and deficiencies, but, but at least it would be fully operational. And, and that's why we need to be a diesel diesel unit. Yes, sir. Yes. And quite honestly, everything that's in the tent that's plugged in it goes towards cooling pretty much. There's and lighting that's yeah. not going in the thing. So. Thank you so much. Yeah. I have a question. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm Dr. Wilcox and Michelle. <clears throat> Since we are talking about the tent, I was curious if the animals that go into the tent are put in that tent because they're strays or they're unraised or for specific reason, or do you do you like call them or watch them? Would you put a brachycephalic? Dog in there? Would you put an obese dog in there? We have chosen not to. Oh, okay. In many cases, this time of year, and yeah. we send out an email, um, sort of describing who the at-risk dogs oh, are: okay. the brachycephalus, the the fat, the old. Um, you know, but what probably will happen is that you know one may slip in there, and um, someone will just notice. Um, that's what happened last year when we got them down onto the adoption floor. We are still trying to be really strategic about keeping the tent population separate from the rest of the population because we're still in the same facility that's prone to the diseases we know and love. So we really want to keep that barrier to the greatest extent possible. Um, so if we do have another outbreak, we don't have you know an entire 500 animal outbreak we have. I, I was I've been doing the clinics all week and it's been very, very hot. And I've seen how just being in line, those dogs are suffering so bad over the other dogs. So I'm just wondering if you, if there's a certain group that you put in there, or if you pick them by the dogs that will do best. Uh, no, it's still all strays oh. and um, pre sterilization, but there are a handful of dogs that can't take it. Can't take it, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Sure. 
Anything else? Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Uh, I'd like to move on to new business. Um, item A, as we all know, there's been a lot of news about uh, leptospirosis. Uh, and so I have a request from the committee that we at least just uh, review it in our meeting today. So I want to thank Dr. Wilcox for coming and if you could, or whoever, I apologize for jumping in the line, but uh, whoever would like to speak about it. Uh, so, uh, I've learned a lot about Lepto. Um, uh, most, most of us that came from back east from the Midwest have already heard of it, but it's really not been on the radar in Arizona until a couple of years. And the state that really, working with the state um, health departments, um, took on a pretty nasty outbreak in Maricopa last summer um, that continues to leak a little bit into this spring. So um, we're somewhat grateful for their, um, they've gone through that and they've been really helpful in helping us devise what, what's going on locally. Um, so historically, we hear about, as a clinician, I hear about one or two lepto cases a year getting hospitalized here and there. Somebody went back east from their poodle and you know, brought it back with them. But we've not had to worry about it too much. Um, last summer, uh, there was a dog in the Phoenix area, contracted lepto, um, was kicked at the hospital at which it was being treated, didn't want to keep it while the owners were out of town, so they uh, didn't tell the boarding facility that uh, they were using that a lepto dog was moving in and it exposed a group and that kicked off. They think that one case kicked off about 70 um, uh, diagnosed animals and I think there were over 50 facilities that were exposed for the centers, clinics, that sort of thing. So here in Pima County, I just heard this number today, the state that thinks he only heard of one reported case in all 2016 here. So we did great last year, but um, uh, there was there has been very recently past month one um, private facility that has really extraordinarily good disease control measures that require every vaccine up to date, negative fecals, like really took very good care um, to to make everyone aware of what disease potential is out there. And somehow they either had a new dog, a dog that traveled, or an asymptomatic carrier um, get into the population and in fact, a slew of animals. There have been, I think, from that single daycare facility, you now seven diagnosed animals. Um, several have been hospitalized with their with pretty significant vet bills. I don't think there have been any deaths, but these patrons happen to be, for the most part, medical professionals. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they work long, long days. Um, one of them was a, a an MD who felt a little off when his dog had been diagnosed with himself on oxycycline, just to <laughs> So, so we heard about that. We were thinking about it, and we were working with the the private, you know, owner, and she was absolutely on top. She scheduled two different vaccination clinics. She's close to the population. She's treating everyone who's exposed, but trying to keep them out of other boarding facilities. Really done a great job. Um, and as you know, you can imagine what this has done to her business. What has been most frightening is the diagnosis most recently. Was it last week? Mm -hmm. Um, of, a, of an independent dog that had nothing to do with this population that uh, was positive for lepto, um, symptomatic for two weeks, but her owner diligently took her to the dog park every day um, for exercise. So for two weeks she was probably potentially shedding and exposing a really large number of animals. So the incubation for the disease is a few days up to four weeks. And as we know, um, in the daycare population that, was, that we've been learning about these past few weeks, they had a dog just break four weeks post exposure. So we don't know what kind of numbers we're going to be looking at. But um, now that everybody's thinking about it, everybody's starting to diagnose lepto. So I don't know if that's because it's always been here at a low level, or finally we're paying attention to something that we probably should have had on our radar before. Um, but there are at least eight cases reported to the state that from Pima, probably two to three more that are being reported and not yet on their books. Um, and we don't know how many of those exposed dogs from Doc Parker not yet so Maybe none. I mean, everybody's, everybody's thinking about lepto and getting vaccines, so we hope that we got the word out and uh, people start taking it seriously. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
back in the chat, uh, Mr. Chairman, that uh, Red Walkers, I believe also, isn't there a new <coughs> potential case possibly associated with a, um, uh, an exposure of Romero pools? Yes. Um, that and, and this one would also not be related to the right. date here. So th that would potentially be the second un epidemiologically unrelated case in the community. Now that one to me sounds more like the traditional level, i.e. you take your dog hiking and there's a pool of water or a stream and the dog's drinking and that dog gets sick. And that's how, that's how Lepto usually, my understanding, not a veterinarian, that's how Lepto is usually spread. But it's unusual. The cases in Phoenix and Maricopa County were also in kenneline like facilities, and so the question is, what is it? And so, to that end, um, like Dr. Wilcox said, we're, we're really trying to learn as much as we can from our, our colleagues in Maricopa County. Um, actually, on Friday, we will have a uh, conference call with the Centers for Disease Control, their veterinary uh, folks, to make sure that we are at least following our best practices. Um, but but that's part of the reason why. Um, why this is such an important issue. Um, the, the, the other piece that I will add is that because we know, because the city of Tucson is a, a, an important partner, as soon as I knew about this, I actually called Albert Elias um, in the city um, on Friday and it let him know, gave him heads up, that, that this was coming down the pike um, because, because we know that we don't want them to get beat up uh, about this and we knew that they were starting to get some queries about this. So, um, so we're trying to be good partners in terms of communicating with both our local, um, our local partners as well as our, our state partners, the state vet, the ABHS, um, and uh, sorry. No, but so, and I think that's something that we've. It's been a great opportunity to meet all of these people, but also you know, we talk about One Health a lot, but this is probably the first test case of what it means to you know take care of our animals and their, their owners. Um, there have not been any cases diagnosed of HAC. Um, I haven't even had an assessment, um, but we are going to be looking at getting some diagnostics um, to have on hand. The tests are not good. They're not, they're not slam dunk, none of them. Um, but the antibiotics are effective if used early, um, and it's doxycycline, which we use a lot to kind of more diseases. So, um, hopefully, if we do have a single dog, we'll be able to identify it. The question is how much, how many, and what, what kind of impact is, what's, where are we at risk of bringing in, and certainly like a dog found at Oodle Park is one that I think we should probably vaccinate and uh, keep an eye on, but um, we don't know how many dogs turned out to have the dogs that are really good left up. We just, we don't even have that information about our community yet. The concept of one health just just to to let you know if you are not at all aware, is it is a really important is a really important concept and is part of the reason why why the health department in the past has had sort of oversight for PAC and that is that all these things are related to each other and especially at a population level um, there are real risks to the human population uh, of some of these zoonotic kinds of diseases, and I know it sounds exotic, and I know it sounds like it's something that happens in Africa or South America, but, it, but it's actually something that happens in this country too. Um, and so that's part of the reason why we want to sort of have, make sure that we have a coordinated response both on the veterinary side and on the public human health side. Dr. Wilcox, if I may ask, um, the vector then is drinking contaminated water, mm -hmm. or uh, usually drinking, but also breaks in skin yes. surfaces or mucosa. So my question is, most of our dog parks are not water fountain for animals, they're buckets. Is there anything that we can treat the water with to keep it safer for the animals? I think perhaps getting, like, don't or is it best to bring your own water? So, yeah, I mean, we kind of said that, but I think the, the message that we've been trying to get out to a great extent is that you need to have them vaccinated. Mm -hmm. Because somebody's going to leave behind a bowl. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, it happens all the time. They blow all over the place to pack. And um, a dog's going to walk up and lick it. 
after the dogs used it. So um, I think that the, the prevention right now should be a serious consideration of vaccination. And that's probably not for every dog. Like the couch potato, the dog that never leaves the house, probably isn't going to get exposed. But um, the ranch dog, maybe. And definitely the boarding dog and the dog park dog. I think that most of the boarding facilities are thinking really hard about already requiring vaccines in there. Your little cars, 18, about 18 years ago, <clears throat> maybe 15 years ago, they were having dogs in the Society stop doing vaccines. Yeah. 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 The Humane Society stopped using Lepto. We gave the combination to every animal, every dog that came in. We gave the, the leptospirosis. And there hadn't been a case in how long? I mean, years. So they decided that the stress that the vaccine put on the animal wasn't worth because, you know, wasn't worth it because there had been no cases. Am I hearing you say that we should, like in our animal shelters, start buying those vaccines again because they're, these animals that we get are all over the place? Well. I'm not going there yet, but the those vaccines, I mean, having a six-in-one vaccine, that's a lot for a dog. Oh, I understand that. But the, the vaccines that um, that are the newer varieties, the ones that are standalone lepto with the four center bars, they're more expensive, but they're good vaccines, and they don't cause the nasty reactions that the old ones do. And that combo vaccine has a lot of stuff in it, so it's not my favorite, not something I would want to use in fact, a circumstance. I know that Tombstone Animal, there have been two cases in Cochise, and I know Tombstone Animal Shelter has decided to vaccinate everything coming in. Because those cases, one was probably dog care, the other one was probably natural exposure. So they've made that decision. I don't think we want to do that, and that would be very expensive. But I do think we need some flats left on one hand for if we find a dog on the adoption floor vomiting, and we know how how widespread disease can go. How but if a client go. asks for a lepto shot, we should have them available, right? Um, the Humane Society is out of them. I'm talking about services. like Asabed or the clinics, the local clinics. Um, I think so. There, I mean, the communities are going to vary. Like, it's not everywhere yet, but the state that is saying, if you're a veterinarian in Arizona, you should be looking for lepto and you should be vaccinated for okay. lepto. Thank you. Dr. Garcia, did you say that there was a confirmed case that came from a mirror pool? That, that my last, uh, my, my, the last communication I got was it was still being called a, um, a suspect that was, hadn't been confirmed yet. So it was a, it was a positive, it was an antibody positive, right. but the dog had been vaccinated right. in the past. And so the so question was whether the antibody, the presence of the antibody in that animal was proof of the previous vaccination, the first proof of a new infection. And so, and so that's why it's not a clear-cut case. But the reason that it got it, it, it got me excited is because you know how many people hike with their animals, um, and animals always uh, you know uh, go to play with water, and and I started worrying about that. And to me, that that is potentially a lot more serious. By the way, the the, the estimated cost, just a rough be, uh, back of the envelope estimate for. For our shelter, it would be over sixty thousand dollars. So it's a it's a very significant investment. That's part of the reason why we are having conversations with CDC because we want to try to identify really what is the best practice, what it, what is what is the real recommendation, and how would it impact both the health of animals in our population and the health of human beings. And there may be a point at which the return on investment would be justified, um, but we better damn well have a good. Um, good justification if we're going to make that investment. My question again is, um, you're saying that, that some of this comes from dog parks. Mm -hmm. On a personal level, I would never take my dog to a dog park. That's my opinion. But shouldn't there be warnings at these dog parks to let people know that this is out there? I think that's what we're trying to do with press release. We can talk specifically about the email dog park and about vaccination and lifestyles. Um, I, I don't know, maybe we should maybe sound much in the city to show us something on this property. Yeah, I think that was part of the reason why, why I reached out to, to Albert yeah. Obvious um, was because because I said, you know, your, your parks and rec people may want to think about this and think about how you are going to approach it. Um, dog parks are very popular facilities. Um, they're very popular facilities both for the county as well as for the city. They're very highly used facilities. 
Um, and so, and so I, I get what you're saying. It, it's sort of like daycare. Um, you know, the minute you take your kid to daycare, you're bringing home lots of other germs. So, um, it, and but it's one of those things where um, I think the, the it may be a benefit to some folks. It may not be to other folks. Doctor Smith. Yes, um, are you are you having a if you're about as you mentioned it's not when strays come in, are you quarantining them to be sure they don't have it before they get mixed into the whether it's the tent or in house? So is the policy. Yeah, so the, the strays, if the strays are ill, they come straight to the clinic. Right. And then we do blood work and urinalyses and that kind of thing. Um, otherwise if they appear to be healthy strays, they go to the tent, right, which is not long. So, um, you know, we are on high alert for it. Because you said that incubation is anywhere from two weeks to four weeks, so you may have a dog that's been exposed that doesn't show any symptoms. Right, a few days to four weeks, and then okay. there are also asymptomatic carriers. Right. Um, but, but yeah, we, th this is the burning question. You know, we know there's a dog parked out there that's like probably pretty hot, but we're all the way across town, and we haven't yet heard of any other cases coming out of that dog park exposure. You've also got a pretty significant demographic out there that goes to their own vets, that handles their own yes. things, that has their own issues, and that dog park, I would, I would, I would unknown how the leptose suddenly cropped up, but high probability of outside vector coming in, drinking, sharing, spreading, you know, so because it hasn't been that common down here. It happens every once in a while, right? It's kind of what I'm hearing. Right, but it, it blew up pretty fast in Maricopa, so that's why we're just paying for it. No, I appreciate that. Yeah. So the, the, the key piece, if I may, the, for the city, I know they're, they're taking a peek at it, but the reality is, is that you know we've seen it at one dog park. Um, our risk manager will, will evaluate the value of signage. Uh, I think they packed it a great job in the press release. Every news station picked it up. Everybody's gone with it. We'll probably add some additional information in our um, news net and other things just to let people know to be aware. Main point for those who can afford to, uh, if the vets have it on hand, is to do the vaccination if it's running around the community. Saves everybody a big headache. And then, um, you know, the, again, we're, we're, we're not unduly concerned at this point because of the fact of where it's occurring for us. And, and potentially, we don't see as many strays rolling in from those areas, generally, generally. One case is one case, and, and like Dr. Wilcox said, we will know two weeks down the road whether, whether um, there are other cases that are associated with that index case. But, um, but you know, I think it's a reasonable question. Dr. Wilcox, does that require two different vaccinations for it to be complete? Yes. Yeah, if your dog has no history of getting left a lepto vaccine, there's the initial, and then depending on the manufacturer, a second shot to the period. So until they have two, then they're pretty much on the They're susceptible. Yeah. I just wanted to add a two, for a brief two cents from a general practitioner is that, yes, I am recommending that, um, that people don't take their pets to the dog park um, until they have their second booster. And um, we just sent out an email last week for our clients and having literally done hundreds of leptospirosis vaccines in the last couple of weeks, um, I will say that the um, small breed dogs are showing a small incidence, not not rare, I mean, common enough for me to actually prophylactically use them in anti-inflammatory um, inflammation of the vaccine site. Um, I haven't seen it in a large breed dog, but I've seen it in a fair number of my small breeds. What, what which manufacturer? Mary by the way, that, that, that reaction may actually just mean that the, that the drug is working. I mean, yeah, that's I know. The, yeah. The, 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 the immune response. Right. right. Just to it give is. you that, at least in human vaccination, yeah. right. part of what we would expect for a safe PV vaccine will, will give you a very strong inflammatory reaction. We do exactly the same kind of thing. So I don't want people to think that we're exposing animals to bad things just for the hell of it. Um, mm -hmm. this, the, that information actually means that, that, that it's doing what it's supposed to be doing. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I'm glad well, nobody is responding that way, but it's also, I mean, yeah. they're like shivering and hiding and they can't even pull it out until they're uncomfortable. So we're just, I'm actually giving them a profile at the end of the day, so we can get the vaccine. Nice. Okay, thank you.
appreciate that. Um, the next item that we have in the business is uh, the adoption packet. Uh, you all received copies of the adoption packet, which were talked about in May, May meeting. Uh, they were filling out immediately thereafter. This is your opportunity to ask any more questions about it. Um, there are discussions after uh, I discussed this with Justin and he has announced last week to um, make changes to the adoption package, streamline it, maybe direct people with more information resources to the adoption through the support center. Um, and we have yet to see that yet, but uh, uh, I wanted to make sure that we had an opportunity to uh, weigh in on provide any comments that you have on the adoption package it's based on the discussion that we had last month. So that's why it's here. Uh, we can make short work of it or long work of it. Comment I'll make. There, it's very thorough. There's a lot of information in here, but looking at it from an adopter standpoint yes. and taking home the animal, mm -hmm. I have a funny feeling we're killing a bunch of babies. <laughs> yeah. um, I don't think that they have the ability to absorb a lot of this if they're not, especially if they're not animal oriented to start with. Um, and that concerns me that maybe as they're looking at these whole packages, possibly ways to consolidate some of the information together. Um, just a thought process because I mean there's a lot of information here, but unfortunately working in rescue for 15 years, people say to you, what do you mean that was in the packet you gave me? <coughs> they had never read it. Um, Dr. Smith. Yeah, um, I know that most of the volunteers go over work with the adoption people. Do, and I know they're really busy, but do they have time to go to go over the <coughs> high points of this packet with the adopting family if they've never had dogs work and don't seem to have the wherewithal to, to, to go home now with the dog and start reading this? Um, I'm going to give you my best guess because I'm an adoption counselor. We have some adoption counselors in the room. Um, the ones that seem the most critical to me based on the situations that we get, because what we're trying to do is figure out what the adopter's all about, what their circumstances are. Uh, it's kind of a con game sometimes trying to actually figure out what their intentions are with the animal. But the ones that really seem to be most important are uh, integrating the animal with whatever they may have at home, the introduction. Um, house training, not so much to me. Removing pet stains and odors, not so much to me. Um, introducing a dog uh, to the resident animal is important a lot because it's one of the reasons that you get the highest numbers of returns on it, at least incidentally from my, without actually having the data in front of us yet, uh, that's what my recollection is. A lot of people say it didn't work out with my dog or my child or my grandparent or something. But introducing it is another critical one. And the other, another one is crate training the dog. If they choose to do that, it's a strong recommendation in some cases, particularly when they're bringing on an animal that's been in a shelter environment and that's been passed around and that's frightened. It takes them a while to stabilize. And uh, uh, those seem to be the ones that I think that we emphasize the most. You can shake your heads if you think I'm right. Um, and I, it kind of goes. I kind of was the same way with cats, except I'm not as much of an expert on them. Um, like litter box problems, yeah. allergies, or common Yeah. yeah. Um, maybe more of the litter box stuff with the cat and the, the dogs and pissing. Um, but one thing that, that came to my mind on all of this is, and in discussions with Justin, was that uh, uh, if we are going to start directing people towards other resources like our support center, it has to be available and easy for people to use. And we have to make sure that it's not going to overwhelm these people. It's, it's very much the technology world that we live in today. For example, when you go to a website, if you can't find what you need in two seconds, you know, Amazon or whatever, people move on. They lose attention and interest in it. And so I am concerned. We're saying that we're directing them elsewhere. And we say that we have these resources on the inside here, you know, we have a list of all the different, uh, in the back, where we have a list of all the different publications. But if they call PAC and ask for this, 
they will get passed around, they will get lost, and eventually hang up because I know that they won't be able to tell them to get those right away. Mr. Chairman, uh, if that's a, a very valid point. I, I will point out to you that, that part of what, the, in, in this sort of modern world, what we're trying to do is we're trying to take this down to two to two to four kind of items. That's that's realistically what people will consume. You're absolutely right, uh, Ms. Barrett. This is this unfortunately ends up being um, the trees. Um, and, and what is is more helpful is a functional website. Um, I, I, I don't anticipate that we will be making uh, a zillion copies of all these resources to send out to families. We, we just don't have the budget, nor do we have the, the staff support for it. But I think your point is a valid one, which is, which is you've got to make it easy for our doctors to get the information that they want. One of the things that, as the, the adoption survey is being re revised and restructured, is to be able to use it as a diagnostic tool to see what kinds of uh, information items people need to walk out with, right? So if they are contemplating, um, you know, um, if they are contemplating a, 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 um, or anticipating having litter box issues or crating issues, um, making sure that, that that does physically go out with people so that so that these things are, are, are tailored rather than you get a stack of, of, of papers um, and that everybody else will get to. So, but, but I think your point is a, is a good one, which is we, we need to be able to, to deliver on that value proposition. Yeah, I guess, I guess uh, what I was trying to say is that uh, we seem to be taking two, uh, I guess, strategic directions with our support center. One is the, the pre-entry, you know, kind of diverse, direct diversion, you know, intake kind of stuff. And the other is we're, we're, we're really conveying the message now that we're there to support you after you make an adoption. But my question is that I'm not sure we really are in a position to do that well yet. I mean, we should be, if we're going to be advocating for that, we need to position ourselves so that we can do it. And so that's, that, that I want to make that point to the committee because I don't think we're there right now. Um, because I just know it. Um, the other thing is, is that uh, uh, we already, like as adoption counselors, we have a, a wall in the back of the main shelter with publications, these things, except even more. Mm -hmm. They're not always there. It's a, it's a huge hurdle for your staff to continue to be making copies of this. So when we go back, they're empty a good portion of the time. But we always, as adoption counselors, try to, based on the conversation that we have with the person, I do a lot. I run back and I grab one that, that I grab the ones that I feel I really need to try to communicate to them, and I make sure I talk to them about it before I send them to the to the uh, licensing area. You know? I'm not sure they really read them. They're overwhelmed. They're thinking about their new dog, but we're at least trying to plan in that direction. I would also encourage the licensing personnel as they have their discussion to review the laws and the rules with them that they tailor the packet if we're still going to hand them out, but. We're going to talk more later about our IT services, but it's definitely something that we need to be, I believe, prepared for if we're really going to push people that direction that they can get to those resources quickly and find the information that they need. Um, Is there a way a lot of this can go onto the website? And if so, how do you
I think we need to we need this needs to live uh, in in the virtual space and it will kill fewer trees too. Um, I just looked through this and I think if you're going to make this two pages, don't put prohibitive pets and hot vehicles the last thing. I think that should be really, especially in the summer, really number one, because people still don't understand how hot apartments. Christy. Um, chairman and team, I just think it's so much better than I thought it would be. I mean, I'm so impressed with the information, and I'm still a paper person. And I would guess a lot of our adopters might be over 50 and don't necessarily Google every single thing. So for the short term, I think this is great. And to always have something there that even if they throw it in the drawer, oh, you know what? I know what's in that drawer. Yeah. So I just think, A, thank you. This is a great packet and thank you for providing it. Well, you know, one comment I need to just yesterday on a phone conversation is that the uh, as we move on uh, in this direction to be more, uh, you know, online and digital, we need to figure out a way to uh, uh, point our customers, because we have a lot of customers that I'm not sure they have the really fall to actually go look up websites, um, that they, we encourage them to use the Pima County Library System and walk in and talk to a librarian that will help them with that. Maybe there's a way that we can have that right at the top Say this, these services are free, they'll help you with this. Please take advantage of it, you know, that kind of thing. Do the best we can to point people there. Uh, Once Chairman, we get that developed, you're absolutely right. Uh, the other piece that's going to be a feature of the new uh, sort of web presence of the county will be a much more mobile, web friendly yeah. version. And even though a lot of folks do not have internet in their homes, oh, a lot of folks do have access to internet. And that's part of the reason why this whole redesign uh, needs to be really thoughtful. And part of the reason why I've been advocating that uh, the package is one of the sort of first entities to get a crack at this. Anyone else? Dr. Romano. I'm just, uh, again, two cents from the general practitioner. And you, I feel like we're an important support Mr. Chair, <coughs> um, Dr. 
literacy, and all this is in Spanish as well? Well, that's the other job. <laughs> so I was just talking to our, uh, Mr. Chair, Mr. Squire, uh, I, I was just talking to our team about we need to prioritize which components of our website are translated and which will be sort of Google translated. Um, and so, yes, absolutely. There are some key pieces, the spay and neuter uh, licensing that will definitely have a Spanish language presence. Whatever survey we send out, we will make sure that we have a way that you can see click a button and make it show up in Spanish if you want to get it in Spanish. Yeah, they're, they're, for those who are Spanish speakers, Google Translate can do some wacky stuff. Yes. Uh, yeah, it's, to, it's to say the least. Yeah, it's, it's not even close. And then, and then uh, syntaxes can get messed up, uh, everything can get messed yeah. up. But anyways, um, the, uh, the reason I ask is of course, you know that you because uh, <laughs> I <don't know>. <laughs> <laughs> Married. Oh, gotcha. Tika, she's Costa Rican. So, uh, so, so um, she's very fluent. And of course, even the Costa Rican Spanish more Castilian than when you go with the Sonoran kind of mix. So it's uh, there's words that don't even mean the same thing. And so, but it, it, I think that's critical. You know, from the city's perspective, it's certainly critical on the education piece. Um, we're setting up a meeting with Karen in the very near future. Um, the city. Uh, uh, a lot of ideas are hitting my head. One of the one of the biggest things when I think about um, the you're right, Kristen, on on the you know well educated people who tend to be in their forties up um, tend to have no problem reading through the paperwork and really don't mind very often. Um, but when you're dealing with young families, when you're dealing with the only generation that you know even my child um, he's learning everything off YouTube. Uh, it's, it's, it's horrifying how good he can be by watching a YouTube video. So it's, it's great that they can translate it. So there's, that's the millennials as well. And when you're talking about those millennial families, especially the lower educated millennial families, I'm thinking that video creation of these lessons, of these options, um, we have the new community media center because of our relationship with Cox. That I'll bring that up to Kristen um, and, and see what we can do. Um, Karen, excuse me, Hollis. Uh, to see what we can do to, to start looking at that. We're starting, I've already talked to Justin and folks heard this last week, Pet Connection is in pre-production mode. Uh, i got to meet with them next week and figure out where you all want to go with that. So it seems to me that this would be a great opportunity to start building on that and then make those, um, you know, they'll all be HD, they'll all be ready to go and they can be added to the websites. Mm -hmm. So that would be the, we'll, we'll talk more. But, yeah, and then what we may even want to consider the community media center is born out of the channel 12 change and the access to sun change and so we have a, a super high-end consultant on rink media to try to make those things happen and i know people county has a large body to make those work too so we'll we'll talk about that's great great thank you um, I see licensing backlog. We talked about it at the beginning of the meeting. Uh, the reason it's on there is uh, we've been talking about it for quite some time. We've been behind. And I think the uh, question that I have at least is what are we doing about it? What's the plan? Do we need temp staff? And the reason is, is if we're going to send a message to the community that licensing is important and that it's uh, a critical thing for us to track in terms of not only building revenue numbers for our main partners, but also giving us the resources to help in with enforcement and tracking animals, then we need to be on top of that. And it's a pretty critical business function in my view. And um, uh, I just wanted to make sure that we're following up and that we're doing what we need to do. And if this committee needs to make recommendation to the county manager or, or supervisors for resources to help with that problem, I think we need to hear that from staff. You'll hear why it's why the numbers look the way they do versus the reality. And the reality is that currently that process is very much a manual process. And so we'll get from Humane Society, for example, hundreds, <laughs> hundreds of, of licenses in a batch. Uh, and then all of them have to be processed. Um, and and one component of which and, and the, the the part where the where the delay is currently in, in existence 
has to do with the, the rabies verification. But I'll be going to turn it over to Kino to explain that. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chairman, we already, I, we already had a chance to discuss some of the disparity in the numbers there. The direct answer to your question is some of the things that we're doing uh, and that we, we hope to be able to do. Uh, we've already taken a look at the staffing, and we, we could say staffing is a problem with everything at PAC or everything everywhere. But um, we've taken some actions to bring in. We have two volunteers that are uh, starting with us, I believe, next week, uh, that have went through some training to be able to go into licensing and help with the data processing and, and taking care of entering this. And we're hoping that those two people will be able to take a, a big load off of the licensing staff and inspire maybe, maybe more people to, to step in and help there. So we're leaning once again on our volunteer group, but for a little bit different than we have in the past. And, and I think that the, not only will that take the load off of our staff, but I think it's going to make our volunteer group more integrated in the PAC process, give them more ownership of what we do at PAC. Um, and I'm hoping that that's, that's a win for everybody. Some other things that we've done is um, Josh has worked on uh, setting up to, we, we send out these letters, uh, we mail out these letters quite frequently, and it's going to be hundreds a day. And the staff is generally, they have to stuff them and they run them to the machine and this and that. So we've set up with a county print shop where we're going to send electronically the uh, information to the print shop. They're going to print stuff, seal, and mail all right from the print shop. Uh, the cost is actually a wash. The, the, the material cost is exactly the same. The, the postage cost is exactly the same. And uh, we're at, that will free up some of our staff quite a bit to, to address some of these things. Um, again, it, it's, a, it's a problem. And, and the third thing, excuse me, is, was um, the, the, the time that it takes us to get some of the, 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 the receipts and the, the licenses back in order to be able to put them in. And like I said, we've, we've already kind of started down that road. We had a couple good good ideas here this evening. Or I was able to glean a couple good ideas from, this, from the board. But um, that's one of the things that, that I'm going to have Josh and, and, and him and I can sit down and take a look at over the next week is what can we do to, to try and close that gap and, and get that more real time. Well, never be real time, but uh, maybe there is, a, as we move towards more web-based, maybe there's a web-based uh, uh, data field that they can, they, can, they can just fill out or a spreadsheet that they can send us. Uh, we'll have to, you know, maybe work with different clinics and see what works best. But I think we've identified the the major problem. Um, and again, it's just a, and it's not like Dr. Garcia was saying. It, it comes in such waves that we can't say, well, we need another staff person to do it because they're going to be wondering what they're going to get. Yeah, they're going to be not busy for two weeks and then swamped for two weeks. So. I think that by bringing in the, the volunteer core, uh, which is, again, I think is going to be a, a very uh, a benefit all the way around at PAC and, and the volunteers, but I believe that that's going to take a big load off. Josh assures me that, and I throw his name out there, I'm going to throw Josh under the bus, and he <laughs> that, uh, that that is going to probably, he, he says that that will be able to allow licensing to catch up with the process up into the point where we're just waiting on the information. But for instance, uh, Mr. Chairman, sometimes we get queries from folks who have adopted an animal off-site or at a partner agency, and they'll say, well, we haven't gotten our license yet. Well, in some cases, we haven't gotten that stack of, of license applications, license paperwork from that entity that is that's doing that on, on our behalf. Um, and so, and, and that's because, you know, they batch it, and they put it together for us and, and you know in some cases they recover a small they do a small cost fee recovery and so they want to make sure that they've gotten their accounting done correctly and, and, and no fault of their own there's got to be we're looking at other ways of, of doing this so that that's not the issue the other issue is that a lot of what we're talking about needing to be automated is is the, the rabies documentation rabies vaccination documentation if it was just doing the darn licensing, you could do the whole darn thing online. That's easy peasy. Mm -hmm. It's the rabies vaccine documentation. One of the things that we have talked about internally in the past has been to create different lengths of licensing depending on the length of the duration of, I'm going to say this wrong, and I'm going to talk more about the, the durability of the vaccination. Some vaccines are meant to be yearly versus some are every three years. Um, and so and so we would envision having a, 
if you have a three-year vaccine with your job, and a three-year license, and if you get a one-year vaccine for your job, and a one-year license, because you can see how these things being out of sync cause lots of um, really gum up the works. Mm -hmm. um, so, but these are right now these are manual processes, and part of what we're looking forward is is a, a, a sort of looking at this from the bottom up and um, with some fresh eyes. Well, I appreciate that. I, I just got two comments. One is if we have partners, it would seem reasonable that the county could make some requirements of those partners to have a more timely submittal of material, especially if they're charging a service fee. That's one. And two, as we redesign our web, the, that, that in, in toto should include an automated system that any partner brings up to put the rabies information in and it comes back electronically. That's a database. We must have a database that we maintain rabies information in right now. Therefore, you would create the front end of it to deliver that information back to PAC. And that should be part of what the IT department is looking at because it's critical to our core business and it's state law. And we should be, you know, so you know that. I just wanted to point it out. Good it's point. That, 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 that our, our partners do this on a voluntary basis. And the cost recovery isn't that they're making any profit on it. Um, and, so, and so we have had conversations with folks, and it's a variety of folks. It's not just one entity. Um, and, 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 you know, because we rely on the cooperation, we, it's hard to place too many demands. But at some point, we may need to. Um, and, and we would anticipate sort of continue to move this along. Um, the, the, I keep saying that, that we need to change our ordinance so that, so that we could issue a license that was only valid if you also had proof of vaccination as an alternative. That way you wouldn't have to actually scan or have the documentation be part of the license process. So in the same way that when you're stopped by uh, the police for speedy, you you are um, you are you have to provide evidence of insurance um, if you were to be stopped to be asked whether your whether your dog was licensed really you would pr produce proof of that license but it was only valid if you also produced proof of the vaccination that's one strategy um, and that we're that we're looking at and, and thinking through the implementation part. I wanted to bring up a couple things. One is a a few years back, well, I don't know, my mom has been gone for about four years, but she and about five ladies, they called them the Tuesday ladies. And they used to go to PAC every Tuesday and they would help the licensing staff. They'd step envelopes, they'd lick. So anyway, you know, and they had a ball. They loved doing it and they got to know all the staff. So I don't know, maybe you could get a group of people that want to do something like that because they really enjoyed it. And the other thing is, and this is silly, but do you all take the money out when it comes in, or do you wait until you process it to take the checks out? I, honestly, I, I, I don't know for sure. I believe that they take it out when it comes in. I was going to say, that's yeah. a lot of money sitting around. It's, it from it's, an accountability, it's from an accountability standpoint. I, I'm pretty sure that, that they our cash handling procedures require us that we okay. I, I, I'm sorry, I'm not sure. I, I can tell you that all cash receipts are closed at the end of the day. Yeah. Whether they're, if they sit, they don't sit for long. No, I was just wondering if, you, if when you stack up the work, the money's in the envelope or it's taken out? No, no. <laughs> oh. all, all cash that's received in that day is closed out at the end of that day. Any other questions or comments back from the uh, Just to comment in, I don't know what the solution is, but uh, it, we get rabies vaccines as well, and we do a lot more rabies vaccines than we fill out the license renewal form, so I know a lot of people aren't sending in their rabies certificates and getting their licensing done. So, I mean, I think if it was really easy and quick, I mean, even if I wanted to be willing to, you know, put the rabies information somewhere or scan something or something, but it would have to be super quick, but, you know. Well, wouldn't it be cool if you could, like, just sort of scan, a, you know, take a, a JPEG, a, take a picture of that proof of rabies mm -hmm. vaccination and have that sort of uploaded as a proof of vaccination? Yeah, well, you know, back in the days when we used to do the triplicate forms, you know, people oh, sent you guys to that point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I was, it was horrible, but at least we would know everybody that we vaccinated for rabies and whether or not they had a license. And so, yeah, I mean, if we could we pronounce rabies vaccine certificate out of our computer system, what that rabies vaccine that we get to a dog, so we could, like, scan those and email them to you easily. 
um, at the end of the day, that would be just one pretty easy step that I think most of our clinics can do. But, so, okay, just some thoughts. Have we spoken to any of the other large um, animal control centers to see how they're working this out? It seems like this is really complicated. The combination of the vaccine and the license, do we know what some of the other large centers are doing to make it or are they all having the same problem? The, 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 I just meant the, the, my perception is that, that when you get above a certain uh, volume of licenses, you start having some of these common problems. Now there are new vendors in this space offering to make it easy to do this. Those vendors come at a cost, and so we have to sort of figure out how we sort of weigh those things. But, but you, this is this is typical for fairly large operations. Um, I will be reporting to you some progress in, in briefly, um, but that's part of what we need to solve. Yeah, I mean, one thought that popped into my mind is, you know, tell me if I'm wrong that the requirements for rabies emanate from state law, right? Mm -hmm. You know, in other areas we have state systems. Mm -hmm. You know, like the taxes or revenue sharing or even uh, elections. It may be that we need to start working you know, on a statewide basis to have these systems developed so that we can, any partner can end it and then it gets back, you know, it's downloaded back to the jurisdiction from the state or something like that. Yeah, you know, I was going to bring that up, but isn't it true that not every county requires licensing? I know that the state law says that you have to vaccinate, but the state law does not say that you have to license. Is that correct? Yeah, so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, it's but, but for instance, uh, to, uh, to the chairman's uh, point, um, in human vaccination, we have a state system called ACES, the Arizona Immunization and Information System. And, and you dump your immunization information in there so that it is available to other providers. There's degrees of compliance on the provider side and on the parent side, but, but you get at least a, a relatively decent representation. It's a state system, it's it's operated by the state, um, and it is for the public good. Um, a, a state solution would, would be fantastic. I, I don't anticipate seeing one in the next four years. But 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 I agree that would solve a lot of problems. That would solve a lot of problems. Okay. Uh, any other comments on that panel? Okay. I'd like to move on to announcements. Uh, we have uh, anything on the management report? Please. Yeah, two brief announcements. Um, one that I was hoping to give you a whole bunch of detail today, um, but I'm not able to um, just because our communication pieces are still evolving. So uh, by the time that we, if everything goes right, by the next time that this advisory committee meets, I will bring, bring with me a, the new uh, director for the Pima Animal Care Center. Um, we are. We have done a lot of um, hard work trying to recruit nationally, um, and have identified a really stellar candidate who is a very uh, high-level uh, person at, who is uh, currently at an existing uh, municipal slash government shelter, um, and that individual I think will be good. <coughs> and as we think about some of these issues, like the very mundane issue of how do we optimize licensing. Um, having that person's insight at the table will be will be critical. Why, why do we need a why do we need to do uh, a, a director and why does it need to be somebody that has national stature? Because we are no longer a dog power. Um, we are a progressive animal welfare agency and we certainly have a lot of things to improve and certainly have a lot more work to do in terms of our performance, um, but we are, we are a, 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 a nationally recognized entity and, and I think we need that kind of sophistication uh, of leadership. And so, um, I, again, I was hoping to be able to make a, a formal announcement today. I'm not, but I'm able to share with you that we have concluded that process and that, that my hope is if everything goes right, that I will share with you um, some very, very positive news and bring with me uh, a, a guest to the next meeting. So that was number one, and that is the most important thing that I have to share with you today the, um, with regards to that particular issue. 
Um, number two, um, we are, um, we just had a very uh, fruitful um, Board of Supervisors session. Um, and Tammy Bear deserves an endurance medal. Through the whole I get paid to do that. I get paid to do that. She does not. Um, so well, let me just tell you really briefly what happened at this last Board of Supervisors session and to also prognosticate what will happen at the next one, in, or the first one in July. So at this Board of Supervisors session, we, uh, the board ratified and approved uh, the intergovernmental agreements with the city of Tucson, the city of South Tucson, and the town of Oro Valley. Um, that is that represents greater than ninety six percent of the amount of the intake, as well as about five ninety six percent of the budget. So for us, that is absolutely huge. Um, city of Tucson, I can't say enough good things about Joyce Garland and the team at the city. Um, who have been absolutely phenomenal to work with, as well as our partners in the town of Laurel Valley and in the uh, town of South Tucson, uh, in the city of South Tucson. Um, the, these agreements um, are, for the first time, all exactly alike and have exactly the same specifications. And the reason that's important is it allows us to, to um, it, it allows us to not um, penalize the jurisdictions that are actually working well together, it doesn't, it, it allows us to not penalize them for being part of the system. And so I, for me, it's, it's really important. Um, one of the commitments I've made to the, um, to the members, the jurisdictional representatives is that, is that we will figure out how to, we know that there are some excess costs associated with with the, what has happened with the town of Miranda and what has happened with the town of Salvadorita. I will make sure as much as we possible that I track whatever excess costs there are associated with that transition and that we that we protect our participating jurisdictional partners, that is the city of Tucson, city of South Tucson, the town of uh, Orvella, from having to bear any of those expenses. So um, that's a commitment on, on, on our part, uh, on the part of, um, of um, you know, the, the county leadership to, to try to make them whole uh, and, and, on, and to honor them for being such good partners. Uh, the other thing that was really, really critical that happened uh, at this Board of Supervisors meeting is that the um, agreement with the Friends of PAC, uh, represented here by Ms. Tammy Barrett, um, was finalized. The reason that that is also a critical piece is that we have been in need of having a, a strong fundraising partner, not-for-profit partner, uh, to help us out in in our fundraising development endeavor. There are certain things that, that will never be awarded to a government shelter. Uh, by the same token, there are certain things that would never be awarded to a Friends of Not-for-Profit group. And so we want to maximize our capacity to capture philanthropic dollars as much as possible. Um, Tammy's leadership, uh, Mike England, um, and um, uh, she's Louise I'm Lorraine. Lorraine <laughs> McPherson. Um, uh, have been absolutely critical in making this happen, and we are just pleased as punch to have this be formalized. And, and thank you, Tammy, because you've done so much heavy lifting. Uh, literally, she sat through the whole darn thing because I had an expectation. I said, you know, Tammy, they might call it when the item comes up, they might pull it off the consent agenda, and then you might be questioned, or you know, you might have an opportunity to speak again. And, and just to your credit, you, you sat there through it. For it all. Again, I get paid to do that, nobody else does. So um, I'm very, very thankful. The really important thing also that is going to happen with the next um, with the next um, board meeting will be that um, the new uh, fee code and ordinance goes into effect. We have taken that as an opportunity to um, what this does essentially, it says that if you are a participating jurisdiction, you get to pay this kind of fee, this kind of fee, and if you're a non-participating jurisdictional partner, you get to bear the full cost of, of the services. So, so it's not going to be terribly popular, but it is something that we have to do because otherwise, otherwise, the city gets to subsidize and the county gets to subsidize these services, and 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 there are implications. For this and we're still trying to work them out, um, but but that will be before the board of supervisors um, during the next uh, meeting. Um, be anticipating new signage, new 
new web messaging that says, you know, and we're trying to figure out how to do this in the most positive, cordial way. We've actually been having conversations with our friends at Humane Society, and they are our friends and they are our partners. Uh, we are having conversations with the, with the folks from the town of Saudita and the town of Marana because it is in everybody's best interest that this transition work out nicely. So, so we are committed to making that happen, uh, but the transition will happen. Uh, there is no agreement to serve those jurisdictions effective uh, July 1st. So, yes, ma'am. Um, two questions, Dr. Garcia. <coughs> the first one is, uh, Patty and I are on the board of Owasa, and we obviously have real concern about the people that are living, pet owners in Moran and Sarita, having access to the county funding. So I told Tammy I would reach out and see if we could set up meetings. Well, I spoke to somebody, and I don't have his name here, and I said, you know, this is what we want to do. You know, we want to figure out a way so that we can get spay neuter for your, 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 you know, your community. And he said, well, you know, we, we're still, and this is what he said to me. We we're kind of talking about that. He said, because uh, Miranda is part of Pima County, and those funds should be coming to us as well. And I didn't have an answer for him, just saying, you know, if you want to meet with me, I'll meet with you. But is that true? That no, it is not. I, I can say. Uh, can you explain that? Chair Gillespie, uh, Ms. Hubbard, I can say incontrovertibly that the way that we pay for spay and neuter in this community is on a per person basis of, on the part of the participating jurisdictions. So, so yes, if you are the city of Tucson, you will get a bill on a monthly basis that says this is the investment in spay and neuter, um, and it would be inappropriate and unfair for me to take those resources um, and use them for a non-participating jurisdiction. Uh, same thing if you are in the city of South Tucson or in the town of Oro Valley. If you are an unincorporated Pima County, the county bears the responsibility on a per capita basis for those residents. Um, and we pay into this pot of money that then goes into, turns into low cost behavior. So absolutely not. Um, okay. I, and I wish the answer was different, honestly, so because, because it would make everybody's life better um, but but you know um, the city manager from the city of Tucson would draw and quarter me very appropriately for using his resources the city's resources to cross subsidize other jurisdictions Thank um, you. and so we, uh, we we can't do that okay and my question number two Kino mentioned that one of the hoarding cases came out of Miranda now, we all know about the animal cruelty laws and Pima Animal Care Center, in my understanding, are responsible for dealing with cruelty in Pima County. Are you going to tell me that they have to deal with their own cruelty issues? So, so uh, Chair Gillespie, Ms. Hubbard, so the, we are delegated those responsibilities for enforcement of cruelty code by those jurisdictions. We no longer have been delegated that responsibility. So, so if I'm not delegated that responsibility, I can't enforce that law because I don't have a legal standing to enforce that law. Um, so, no, I that will be solely rest solely on the shoulders of the non-participating jurisdictions. Miranda, Miranda has its own set of codes. Each city has its own set of codes. They're not necessarily but the, the, but state. the cruelty code is a state code. It has to be enforced. Well, but, but, the, but, this, but the agent to, to enforce that state code ends up being the, the jurisdiction uh, reference. In this case, uh, in this case, uh, the, the, the city of Tucson, for instance. Right, the city delegate. Right. Mm -hmm. So those, those are delegated responsibilities. Um, so so it, it, I realize, again, this is another area that makes a lot of people uncomfortable, makes me uncomfortable, make, doesn't necessarily make me happy. but. But it is one of the reasons why it made some sense to sort of have this centralized. The other area that you will hear about, because I'm getting emails about, is the issue of rabies. So, so, so understand that our responsibility that has been delegated to the county on rabies is on the human side, not on the animal side. And so 
we will, of course, respond to any human investigation or any doctor. What, what usually happens is an emergency room will call and say, I have a patient, this is the situation, should she or he get the rabies vaccination? We will, of course, respond to any of those queries. We will not do, however, the bite investigations or the quarantine of those animals or the confinement of those animals because, again, those are delegated responsibilities that no longer that we no longer have a delegation agreement for. So it's going to be messy, and it's and it's something that we are watching like a hawk. And that's part of the reason why we want to be as open and transparent with our non-participating jurisdictional partners, um, because because this needs to work. Um, and I um, and I know that the, 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 that that is not necessarily what any of us would like to do, but that is a very real and legal consequence of the termination of those IGAs. Well, but I guess the thing is that I thought that the county was all-knowing and all-powerful. I really guess I didn't realize that the independent communities or the cities or towns really aren't part of the county in that respect. State, state law allows them to decide how they wish to take action on what they're required to do. Gotcha. And, and Thank you for that yeah. explanation. Yeah. I don't like it. But no, it's so not <laughs> <laughs> I think it was all our best interest to, to do the transition in a cordial manner. Has there been any discussion about using our enforcement personnel to do kind of orientation, yeah. transition training with Marina law enforcement, because they're creating more than law enforcement community for this, and I can use saw a too, because you know I have a third manager and others. In terms of Gillespie, uh, the, the members of the committee, uh, they won't need to because they've recruited them away from our community. <laughs> 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 because they've recruited them away they from our They've stolen oh, so, so, hired them away. Okay. So therefore, I don't, I mean, I think that they will have some institutional knowledge that will allow them to be successful. Um, and um, and so I don't, I don't think that that's actually going to be the, okay. the, the tough point. I think the tougher point is going to be much more the, the customer messaging, right? Mm -hmm. so, so I'm in Marana, I live in, within the town limits, uh, and just getting used to the fact that if I have a pet-related enforcement need, oh, there's a big dog waste poop thing or noise complaint, I need to call the town of Miranda for resolution, not, not PAC. And I think that that's where some of our bigger problems are going to be. So, um, yeah. Okay, great. Any other uh, questions or comments on the management report? Okay. Is, this, is, is Sarita Heights part of the town of Sarita? Is, is Sarita Heights covered by the county? Like, could we do spay neuter on that side of the highway? <laughs> <laughs> Fabulous. What is unincorporated? I mean, the critical thing is unincorporated Pima County. Okay, and, and, but I don't know if Sarita yeah. Heights is left the technically the part of Sarita. Who asked Josh to look at the map? Yeah. Yes, yeah. yeah. so there you go. That, Cherry Gillespie and Ms. Hubbard, one of the tough things for us is that we've never differentiated where, where our customers come from. Um, we have worked very hard to not differentiate. We want to treat everybody equally. Uh, but we are building into our processes ways of determining people's domicile, people's residence. Um, and, and I'm not absolutely sure, but if you are in the unincorporated side of the if you're in, in unincorporated community, you are, you are legal to do that spay and neuter um, uh, for the uh, residents to benefit from those spay and neuter services. Um, just one question. When you run that match, that state your match, is that all donations? So could people come from these communities that are no longer connected to PAC? Are you talking to me? Yes. Could oh, anybody can come from that? We do not use yes. Pima County money for, for that. Okay, so we could get those people involved. Uh, the veterinarians don't want to give them up for that. <laughs> <laughs> but the people can't afford to go to the vet. Yeah, we, we fund that. Okay. Actually, I, I've been able to get funding from the Arizona State Pet Friendly License Plan, right. okay. and we've gotten donations, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think we do, oh, I, think, I think on our part, that, that yeah, you guys we do some in-kind kind of stuff right. to I do it. So, 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 so,
right. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yes. Okay. And that would not be that would not be impacted because it's no. being run by a private organization. Okay. okay. Um, and and, and you know, we will continue to support. We will we will continue to support community wide efforts that move forward our animal welfare. Um, it, it, that's our bottom line. But, um, but unfortunately, we, we do have to make these distinctions because, because of the real cost of all these many things that we do. Okay, so does the committee have any... Mm -hmm. Mr. Chair, yeah. the only other thing I was going to say is, is I'm 20 minutes late for something, so I'm going to have to excuse myself. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for your uh, Dr. Donald. I just actually have a kudos and a comment from the Southern Arizona Veterinary Medical Association that I represent on this committee. Um, we just had our quarterly um, board meeting, and um, it's just really nice to be able to report positive progress and back to my board as I have most. So I'm just really happy to be able to do that. And they're extremely <coughs> appreciative. They are very supportive of all the changes that have happened. And um, and grateful, and um, I'm also really happy to be able to report on um, this committee and how um, really wonderful it is to see all the support and collaboration and problems going to happen here. And again, they're just extremely grateful and supportive of this committee as well. And um, we were feeling particularly generous, generous so we donated a thousand dollars to that. Anyone else? Um, I just had a, the only thing I really had to mention today was that we uh, decided at, at uh, our member of Queen's recommendation a few months back to uh, provide certificates to volunteers uh, for their outstanding service, and then those are picked by our volunteer coordinator, uh, Tim Cook from the community of volunteers at PAC and, and others. And uh, I think that the, the problem that he has, a lot of the volunteers have different hours, different days, different weeks, they can't make it to these meetings for the presentation. So I've discussed with, with Justin only, but uh, he knows him now, and, and Michelle. Um, it may be appropriate, a good idea might be that we find a way to hand these out at PAC where people actually frequent the building either at some kind of staff meeting or we create some kind of ceremony. So what what I would like you guys to do is is put your heads together. And I think it needs to be a meaningful uh, meeting. Uh, and I'll be happy to be there. I signed some new ones today. Uh, but, but we, we want to figure out a way that we can recognize our volunteers who are contributing so much time and in a meaningful way. And it didn't see, it seemed awkward to me last week they were here. And, we signed them and we said some things about them. We can still do that for the record. Um, and maybe we should, we should put this back on the agenda for us to have a discussion. But I would appreciate it if staff would also have that discussion and forward any recommendations that you have to me um, on how you think it might work well. And I think we can maybe put the word out to the volunteers on how they might like to have it happen too if, if, if we get any feedback. So um, I just wanted to mention that. Um, and finally, we have Christy's uh, management report as a volunteer representative. Unfortunately, mine was kind of long um, for this evening, but I will uh, try to be uh, as brief as possible. Excuse um, me, Christy, would you mind staging up just a little bit? Sure. Okay, absolutely. Um, so uh, we have a couple uh, positive things to report. We have our, our uh, behavior institutes been working uh, with our animals and putting um, some programs in place for um, enrichment inside the kennels and outside the kennels, working with some of our behavior um, animals. Uh, so that's that's starting out um, going pretty well. Um, let's see. Uh, we still have challenges uh, with strain between staff and volunteers. Um, I think right now um, there's a number of reasons for that. Uh, lean staffing still um, with Jose being gone and not having held that position yet. Um, there's not sort of a, a, a head leader right now. Um, there's a lot of things going on. Um, it's our busy time. Um, 
but with the lean staffing, the staff is not as present in the areas where the animals are housed and cared for, and I think that causes just a, a number of, of issues that kind of balloon out from there, um, because the volunteers have to step up to the many animal care-related tasks that staff are not able to do. Um, that puts volunteers in a, in a kind of difficult position of being the first to observe, uh, address, and report issues to staff. Um, reporting issues to staff just on its own creates a, a major strain on our relationships between staff, um, whether that be through email or a discussion. Um, but that's, that's, you know, kind of a growing issue right now. Communication um, is a major issue right now. Um, it's a key factor in some of these problems. Getting responses from staff, um, email or otherwise, um, is difficult, um, even in regards to animal welfare and critical, urgent cases of animals that are looking for rescue or things like that. So that's something that I think we really need to improve on, we need to work together on. I've met with Dr. Garcia, I've met with Justin. Um, having a new leader, I think, is going to be critical to making that, you know, uh, improvement and change. But it is a factor that I think, you know, needs to be brought out into the open. Um, other issues are knowing who the ever-changing point of contact is for a particular thing. Um, could be uh, live release is a big is a big issue because we've got foster program, we've got. Uh, rescue program, we've got all these different uh, folks in different areas, and trying to find the right person to respond in a timely manner is difficult. Um, it's not always communicated to the volunteers when policies or uh, points of contact have changed. Uh, we still have issues with closing time and um, volunteers being ushered out um, when staff is trying to um, close off certain areas of the shelter, which is understandable, but um, because of what I mentioned earlier, where we have volunteers picking up responsibilities where staff is not able to or not um, assigned to do in the shelter areas, makes it difficult for these volunteers to get out of the shelter at the times when the staff would like them to, to leave. Um, so that's created some issues. Um, we have had a recent issue um, just in the last couple of weeks where Communications between the live release department and the volunteers have really changed over the last couple of years. We've really worked on things. We've really had built a good communication. Um, that broke down a little bit recently um, where an animal who was on a deadline was, uh, an animal had been in the shelter for a long time, was euthanized with no notice to the volunteers. Um, and even though the shelter may not have the responsibility to advise volunteers when an animal is going to be euthanized, this was something that was different than the procedures that have, you know, grown in the last couple of years, and it built a pretty big rift between volunteers and staff. Um, and, you know, we're working hard to try to rebuild that trust and kind of get over that, but um, it was a pretty major, major issue. Um, so basically, um, I think we're trying to get past that. We're trying to work with the uh, management, work with the staff to try to figure out or identify where these issues are and um, work to bridge them. So that is um, really the most important thing is on my report tonight. Um, I think when we have our new leader come in that that's going to be something that will be a challenge and will be a big factor for us all to work on. Central Pat, what came out last night? Thank you for that and I, I know that's difficult for you so I appreciate you coming up this me. Uh, call the audience. Uh, do, we, do we have any uh, sheets?
And I think it's something, it's an important thing that needs to be addressed and needs to be figured out. We haven't quite figured out how to do that, how to, uh, how to assess the relationship between the returns and the adoptions, but it's definitely something that needs, that needs speaking to. But uh, I let that go because so many things came up in the meeting today that I could have added to, but I can't because I'm the audience and you're the committee. Uh, so I'm going to talk about those. One is the uh, adoption packet. And the question was, do the adoption counselors go over the packet with the adopters? And the answer is no, because we do not have the packets. We do not give the adopters the packets. They are given to the adopters when they go to the licensing window. So after they've spent an hour or two or however long choosing their pet, and they're excited and they're ready to go, and we've talked to them until we're blue in the face about don't take the leash off, don't open the door, all of those kind of things, then they go to the licensing window and it's a, a huge amount of time to process the license and they go through a million things and then they're given this big packet. And you guessed it, they don't read it when they get home. Um, this kind of came up uh, because I also do offsite adoptions, so I do have access to the packet and I knew what was in it. And uh, several months ago, Barry and I had a conversation because once I took a look at it, I said, this is insane, this is a crazy packet. And what I was concerned about is because our new pet support center, which is the absolute best thing we've got going for people who have needs, problems, or questions, is not in the packet except on the very last page. It's an afterthought at the bottom of a photocopy thing where the phone number is there, and it's not emphasized to the adopters. So when I do offsite adoptions and I go through the packet, I flip to the last page, I circle the phone number, and I say the most important thing I'm telling you today is if you have a question, a problem, a concern, a need, you call this number. And I do the same thing at the shelter, even though I don't have the packet, I have a pocket full of business cards, for the pet support center. And I tell them, the last thing I tell them, this is the most important thing I'm going to tell you today. Here's the business card for the pet support center. Questions, concerns, needs. You call it. They will help you. They have resources. But that's not, not prominent in the, in the packet. And when I brought up the packet, and I went to Justin and I said, this is kind of dumb, and why is it in this order? Why is the first thing or the second thing, you know, house training or pet or whatever, and why is this at the end? And the response, the answer I was given is, this packet and the pieces that are in it and the order that they're in was approved by communications, which is a department at the county. We can't change it. This was done when Ellie was the adoption coordinator and she decided what should be in and it went to communications and they said, okay, and we can't change it, we can't take anything out, we can't put anything in, we can't put anything in a different order. I said, that's insane. So that's where we have it. That's why it is where it is. And the uh, free vet visit, Dr. O'Donnell, I've probably had my first ever adopted dog for about a year and a half. I brought her to your office to be the vet. And you were not on the back of that thing. And I asked, and they, your staff said, of course we do, we take this. So I went back to Pat, and I said, Northwest Pet Clinic is a partner in doing this. Why aren't they on this? Well, I don't know. We don't have any more room on the sheet. We'll fix it. We'll put it on there. A year and a half later, it's not on there. So the, the, one of the other things I told my adopters is you will get a certificate for a free vet visit. There's about 30 vets on the back. If yours isn't on there, Call your vet, say I just adopted a dog from PAC, will you honor this certificate? Many of them do. So, you know, I can see the problems, I can take the problems to staff, and that's the result. That's what I get. That's it. And then your questions about offsite adoptions and why are the numbers down? And it's it's something that I I try to analyze all the time when I'm there. I'm the lead adoption counselor twice a month at PetSmart and Oracle and Wetmore, the second and fourth Saturday. So I'm there all day those two days. Barry's often the driver. He will often stay and do adoptions with me. Um, it's kind of a, a crapshoot. Sometimes we get awesome dogs and we don't adopt any of them out. I don't know why. Sometimes we get loud, big, noisy, troublesome dogs and we don't adopt them out. Um, part of it, you know, we hardly ever get small dogs, but there's not a lot of small dogs that are available. But also, the contract we have with PetSmart, 
um, what I just found out, sometimes I'll ask Mark to give me specific um, dogs that I know, and he'll arrive without those dogs, and I say, why didn't you bring Buffy? And I find out it's because they're on medication. The contract with PetSmart says we cannot bring any dogs from Pat that are on any medication. Even the most inane medication, they're not contagious, they're not sick, they're on a, an antibiotic or they're on a, a pain med or antibiotics or whatever, we cannot bring them. We can't bring a dog that's special needs, we can't bring a dog that's CY release because we don't have a staff person there to explain the CY release problem. So there's all kinds of things. We, we don't always get the best dogs at PetSmart. We get five to seven dogs. Um, yep. if, if we adopt a few, we're, we're lucky. But anyway, that's the, that's the question. And then the whole thing about surveying and changing the survey and making it better. I have a group of uh, volunteers who work on this on a constant basis. We take information to Justin and say, here's what we think would make the survey better, would help us make better matches. They work on it, they come back to us, and there's less on it than there was before. So there's a lot of things we're working on, but we're really not getting a lot of cooperation in a lot of areas. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. I, I just wanted to comment that the communications I brought that to, uh, that it has to be approved by communications mm -hmm. form to Dr. Garcia and Jan Lesher, the assistant county manager, and they both looked at me like, we don't think that's a requirement. But I don't have, I haven't gotten back, you know, hadn't had a chance to have a meeting with you to follow up on that and see what's going on. So, Thank you for that. Uh, I'll let you run over, but I want to hear what you have to say. Um, future agenda items. Um, I wanted to send, send notice that I have a, uh, a few things that I have on the list that I will be contemplating that for the next couple of meetings. Um, review of uh, updates to the adoption survey form. Uh, we talked about it last meeting, particularly in regards to where our new policies are for decline and outdoor animals. Um, I also intend to pursue, uh, we've, we've talked about this a lot, uh, the, or we've had it brought to our attention a lot, and we keep hearing that we have no legal position in our contracts uh, that we provide to adopters. And I'm really tired of hearing it, so I'm going to start diving into that because I don't understand why, as a county entity, uh, I think we need to have a discussion with our county attorney's office, is what I'm trying to say. And we need to get it flushed out. Uh, because if we have state laws and things that Ms. Sherwin, excuse me if I pronounced your name wrong, um, brings it to our attention all the time, I don't understand why we don't have the legal basis to put some information in our contracts to notify people of what our expectations are and if we have a leader with our law enforcement officers, it might give us a better track record in terms of enforcing those issues. So I think it's important that we open a dialogue with the county attorney's office and let them know our position on that. Um, and uh, the other thing is I want to start building, and we heard a lot of discussion today about information technology and the, the, the vast county resources that we have in terms of information technology that might make things kind of better. And I think we need to start opening that dialogue. I've had these discussions with Dr. Garcia. It's time to start opening that discussion and that dialogue with other county departments so that um, we get things moving. We keep trying to improve those areas. Okay. I was going to say that um, I, I went to, when I was on the packet years ago, they were telling us that you could not refuse anybody. and. Um, I said, that's not true, <laughs> you know, we have we need a suitable home. And they had a lawyer from the county come and tell us that we could not refuse anybody. And I got a letter personally telling me that we can't refuse anybody. Yeah. And I, I think that needs to be addressed. I was, fine, I wasn't talking, we can't really discuss it today because it's not. No, I mean when you talk yeah, to Yeah, but I think that uh, we need to have some of these discussions. And one thing I do know, having dealt with terms a lot and been the elected official is that you know, there's a cultural position they take sometimes because it may be a path of least resistance and there's also what the community desires are and getting those in alignment sometimes takes some work and so we may have to do that kind of work as well suggest mm -hmm. okay all right uh, are there if there's no further comments what i would like to do is ask for a motion to adjourn mm -hmm.
And I've got a, I'll second. All those in favor? Signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed? Aye. 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 A